Well, good morning once again, and I would like to welcome everyone who has joined us in this Northwest Network Caregiver Town Hall. Uh, we have the usual cast of subject matter experts helping me to answer questions today, and our goal is to really answer as many questions um, as possible, uh, really having this as an open format, a uh, comfortable dialogue across the Northwest Network. We've received a few questions in advance, so we're going to do our best to address each and every one of those. But before we get into the business of the meeting, I just have um, uh, one thing to announce from a housekeeping perspective that we are recording this meeting so that uh, other caregivers and providers who are not able to attend are able to hear it at a later date and time. And what I'd like to do now is ask Dory Stevens, our Chief Administrative Officer for Ketchikan Medical Center, <laughs> to offer us a reflection this morning. Dory. All right, thank you, Chuck. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. So the reflection today is what we do every day matters more than what we do once in a while. Make it easy to do right and hard to go wrong. Focus on actions, not outcomes. By giving something up, we may gain. Things often get harder before they get easier. When we give more to ourselves, we can ask more from ourselves. We're not very different from other people, but those differences are very important. It's easier to change our surroundings than ourselves. We can't make people change, but when we change, others may change. We should make sure the things we do to feel better don't make us feel worse. We manage what we monitor, and once we're ready to begin, begin now. That's a, great, sent that's a great sentiment, Dory. Thank you so much. It makes me think about um, not only the change that we're experiencing as COVID is decreasing in our communities, but also the change that's occurring with spring. I think all of our communities are seeing a little bit more sunshine and a little bit less snow and rain. And so uh, spring and then summer is just going to be right around the corner. So with that spirit, our goal today is to not only talk about um, the latest with respect to COVID, but also to look at those things that what I would consider um, are our normal topics that we would consider uh, and discuss in a caregiver town hall. Uh, things around safety and quality and things that we're working to do to reinvest in the organization and to address the needs of our caregivers and providers. And so um, uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, answering some questions around COVID. And so my first subject matter expert who's going to help me out with some questions that came in in advance is Raymond Bellamino. Um, Raymond is our director for uh, in the Northwest Network for Infection Prevention. And Raymond, you've uh, you and I have received a couple questions in advance today. Um, the first one um, is related to visitors who may be fully vaccinated. And um, why don't we allow fully vaccinated visitors um, in addition, you know, beyond just one visitor per patient, gosh, if there's a whole family coming in and they're vaccinated, why aren't we letting everyone into the into the patient's room uh, to visit? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Chuck. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so really good question, especially as we're seeing uh, many of the community based restrictions uh, eased uh, in our respective communities. It's important to recognize that, you know, while the CDC and our respective state, state health departments have released, relaxed some of those restrictions, um, guidance remains intact for healthcare facilities from the CDC. And so part of those recommendations continue to be um, limiting the number of visitors in our healthcare facilities. Uh, we're still learning a lot about variant strains in our communities and um, and the uh, effectiveness of our vaccinations on those variant strains. So until we really learn and understand more about the impact of those strains, uh, we're really staying in lockstep with the CDC recommendations for healthcare settings. Um, you know, some of you may have seen uh, some data and headlines around some uh, variants uh, just right across the border in British Columbia. So really wanting to stay very tuned in to what that means for our community activity and what might be brought into our facilities by visitors. Um, just as we've always been practicing, visitors would still need to practice all safety precautions, be screened upon entry, uh, practice good source control and hand hygiene and so on. So at this point, we're really sticking to the CDC guidelines in terms of visitor restrictions and uh, keeping that very close screening process intact. 
Thanks, Raymond. I'm going to keep you on the hot seat for a little while longer sure. um, because I think the, the, the availability of vaccinations um, has really caused our caregivers and providers to think, hey, well, what's going to change? Uh, what are we going to see differently? When can we um, release some of the own, uh, some of the restrictions that we've placed upon ourselves? Um, so, for example, um, pre procedural testing um, and some of those extra steps that we have people go through prior to um, coming into the facility or receiving care at our facility. And then I'll just go right into a part B is do you, do you anticipate a time when we as caregivers who have our vaccinations may not um, need to wear a mask on a daily basis and that we could have a little bit more freedom um, thinking more along the lines of how um, flu is treated rather than COVID. So if you could maybe yeah. think about that from a big picture perspective, it, I'm sure many, many people are curious. Yeah, also a really good question. Um, again, just to the point I, I just made around really understanding what kind of the next phases of community transmission and community activity look like, uh, specifically pertaining to the strains, the variant strains. Um, you know, we see universal masking for our caregivers, uh, patients, visitors to be in place for the foreseeable future. Uh, again, that's remaining in lockstep with national and state level guidelines and recommendations and requirements. Um, but again, until we truly understand uh, more about um, the burden of these variant strains and even the existing strains that we have been uh, come accustomed to, um, really understanding what what that means for us within the healthcare facility, recognizing that we have vulnerable uh, patient populations uh, within our walls and want to do everything we can to make sure that we're creating a safe environment as possible. So, uh, you know, really understand that question and wanting to move forward into, you know, thinking about how we get, how we, uh, are able to pull back from some of these uh, recommendations. At this point in time, we, we just really want to take a very cautious and careful approach as we look to de-escalate some of our measures. And again, universal masking will, will remain intact for uh, the foreseeable future. Uh, in terms of pre-procedure testing, uh, again, you're going to sound like a broken record. <laughs> you know, as we continue to learn more about vaccine effectiveness on the variant strains, and uh, as we have more of our community vaccinated, we'll be moving into those steps of evaluation and assessment of how we manage um, uh, patients coming in for procedures and understanding their COVID status. So, Raymond, I think there was a key word that you said that that really made an impact on me, and you said our patients are vulnerable. And so um, we are in a healthcare setting. And so even though we recognize that wearing masks pose a communication barrier, we can't have the same uh, facial and, and body language communication in addition, just the good auditory communication. But we really do need to be in a position of continuing to protect all of our patients and knowing that they've got some of that vulnerability um, right. And and so uh, it requires us to perhaps behave um, at a higher level uh, for a longer period of time. But I, I really do think that that word vulnerability um, is a key decision uh, factor. I think the other thing too, and, and as, as I look at my own personal crystal ball, I'm really curious to see what the um, next flu season will look like because yeah. all of this mass compliance, all this social distancing has really um, eliminated the traditional flu season in our communities. So um, I think we may have learned something for future <laughs> flu seasons that might be applicable. Um, Raymond, I don't know if you had a chance to uh, see uh, Lynn Rose's comment that just came up in chat. Lynn, thank you very much for um, putting a question in chat, but I think this is still you, Raymond. Sure, happy to take a shot at that one. So um, the data is really still early on whether vaccinated individuals can transmit COVID to someone else. The vaccine effectiveness studies really focused on development of uh, mild, severe, and critical illness post-vaccination. Um, there are some studies uh, in Europe and uh, some patient cohorts that are being followed around transmissibility uh, post-vaccination. So again, the data is early on that, um, and that's why we still want to take a very cautious approach post-vaccination, um, really not understanding fully what that means for asymptomatic transmission uh, of a fully vaccinated uh, individual to uh, a non-vaccinated individual. So Lynn, great question. Um, 
I uh, wish I had more information on that, and if others have some insight, would welcome input. Uh, it's just a really too early to, to know for sure, uh, but there are some large cohort studies that are being conducted um, that we expect will uh, shed some light on that. Thanks, Raymond. I know Dr. Carlo Pudi is on the call, and I think he just flashed um, raising his hand. Uh, Dr. Carlo Pudi, is there anything that you'd like to add to the latest and greatest on uh, our understanding of COVID? Thank you, Chuck. Thanks, Raymond. Um, so, Lynn, great question. In countries where we have been able, they have been ab able to vaccinate a large number of people, the vaccine has stopped transmission. Examples like Israel that has about 88% of their population vaccinated, the vaccine stops transmission. In the rest of the world, we know for a fact that uh, we have many, many cases where people who have been vaccinated have gone on subsequently to test positive for COVID. They might develop a milder form of the disease, but they never develop the severe form of the disease. What that essentially tells us is that if you can get a mild infection with COVID after a vaccination, there is no reason why you cannot transmit that to somebody who's vulnerable. So it's essentially uh, it's uh, it's essentially guaranteed that if you, if somebody after a vaccine develops COVID, they can give it to somebody because the virus doesn't discriminate um, in terms of um, you know the vulnerable the ones who are not vaccinated. So I would say yes, they can absolutely give it to somebody. Thank you very much. Really appreciate those additional comments. And Lynn, thank you for asking your question. We're going to change the topic for just a moment, but it's still related to COVID, but it's kind of the future. Um, and, and it's a question for Jamie Barlene from uh, Human Resources. Uh, we've, uh, the question that came in is, you know, there were several job postings that were considered in-house jobs. Um, and now when we see them posted, um, they appear to be uh, remote work jobs. Um, and so the, the key question is, gosh, what's the future going to look like? Are we going to have um, uh, jobs now that are going to be remote only, um, or are they going to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis? So, uh, Jamie, if you're out there, um, why don't you take a shot at answering that question, please? Yes, hi. Uh, happy to answer that question. Sorry, I'm having some camera difficulties, but currently leadership is assessing in-house positions that are now remote due to the pandemic to determine if they should return to an office or, or remain remote. Through navigating the um, complexities of the pandemic, we have discovered new insights and innovations in how we connect, work, and deliver our healing mission to the communities we serve. These decisions are being assessed um, on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the position. Um, for a status on a specific position, if it's going to remain remote, I would suggest for the caregiver to submit a MyHR case so they can receive some more specific information on the potential for that position to remain to work remotely. Thank you so much, Jamie. I really appreciate that insight. I think the one thing that for sure um, that we've learned is COVID has caused us to really evaluate a lot of things. Um, the one thing I'm most excited about is our ability to have an entire Northwest Network uh, town hall meeting virtually. And for everyone who is listening in today, for everyone who's interacting via chat, um, thank you so much. Um, this allows us as an entire network to connect and work together and hear the same message at the same time. So um, this is one of the things that are absolutely going to continue forward um, so that we can do as much communication as frequently and as easily as we possibly can across the entire network. And speaking of across the entire network, uh, I have the chief administrative officers from, from each uh, community, our critical access hospitals, ready to talk a little bit about um, how things are changing um, from a very high level, what's going on at each of that, uh, each of their unique communities, as well as how we are getting back to normal and, and, and reducing some of our COVID preparation activities as COVID is reducing in our communities. So I'd like to ask Chris Johnson from United General to go first. Chris? Yeah, thanks, Chuck. Um, happy to comment on that. You're, you're right. We are starting to see more business as usual. Um, the hallways are uh, 
more populated with individuals, could be vendors working on uh, capital projects and those types of things. So that's fantastic. But by and large, probably the biggest impact as we see this, this de-escalation occur from our, our COVID um, pandemic is that we've now moved our uh, visitor policy from a patient per day to a patient per day. And that's really significant for us because with our swing bed population, our acute rehab population, they're here for you know upwards of a couple of weeks. And so this really um, impacts them and their ability to see more of their loved ones. And, and clearly we all know that helps their healing process. So we're, we're really excited to see that happen for our folks here down at United. Great, Chris. Thanks very much for that update. Uh, Jack Estrada, our newly announced Chief Administrative Officer for Peace Island Medical Center. Uh, Jack, what's going on in Friday Harbor and San Juan Island? Thank you, Chuck. And uh, much like like Chris mentioned, and we're going through some of those changes as well. Uh, you know, we're, we're not doing temperature checks now. We're doing self assessments, uh, self assessments. Pardon me. Uh, the you know vendors are starting to come back into our our building uh, on a case by case basis. Um, for various projects, much like, like Chris was mentioning. We've eliminated our greeter and uh, that we had, we had a temporary greeter for quite a while, but the, the biggest change and the most welcome change that everyone has uh, been excited about is the, uh, the ability to let our volunteers back into the building and assist us with things like our vaccine clinics, uh, checking patients in, uh, running errands for us. They're just very excited to be here and we're thrilled to have them with us. So, Terrific. Thank you so much, Jack. And then Dory up in Ketchikan. How, Hi, are, things How are things changing up in Ketchikan? All in good ways. All in good ways. Um, one of the big things that we've been able to do over the last couple of weeks is uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, when we were standing up our COVID unit, it required us to close the hallway between the hospital and the medical group. Um, so that created quite a bit of disruption for our patients because if they were in the clinic and they needed to come over to the hospital, they basically had to leave the clinic, go into their cars, drive around, and come into the hospital. And we were able to open that up about three weeks ago, uh, maybe a little bit more. So. While it sounds very simple to open up a hallway, it really was um, huge for us, so that was pretty cool. Um, and with those changes, um, within the next week or so, it looks like we'll be able to open up the Pinky Brindle Cancer Center because uh, that was being used as a break room um, for COVID. And it's just been really nice to be able to focus on some different things besides COVID, you know, other quality um, focus and, and metrics and um, employee engagement and patient experience and all those really great things I think we probably took for granted pre-COVID. And then our front door uh, changes are like everybody else and it was pretty exciting to be able to open up our gift shop and bring back the volunteers. So all very positive movements. We're We're pretty happy about that. Great, Dory. Thank you so much. And the Pinky Brindle um, Cancer Resource Center is an amazing place. And so um, really we are reopening our doors to our communities in so many ways. So I'm glad to hear that one's coming back. Um, so uh, thank you. And that Elliot, one's right hot off the press. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Yeah, that's that's one of the advantages of joining the caregiver town halls because that wasn't news yesterday, but it's news in today's session. So thank you. We also have Elliot Quita, our Chief Operating Officer for the network for the Northwest Network. Elliot, why don't you tell us what's going on um, at St. Joseph? Sure, Chuck. Uh, one of the beauties of going last is I get to basically say ditto. Uh, my colleagues have outlined uh, many things that are happening in their communities, but they're also happening here at St. Joe's. But I think Dory hit on one of the things that's really uh, important in the, in the post-COVID world is that our ability to refocus on things such as our quality metrics and our performance, um, you know, both operationally as, as well as in other ways. And so um, our caregiver engagement aspect is, is one of those important things that we're doing, and these town halls are a component of that. The other thing that I would just mention quickly is in small 
appropriately masked, socially distanced groups, we are able to do some work together face to face. And just just this morning, I was able to spend some time with some colleagues looking at some space for some programs in some of our available buildings. And so that just felt really good to do. So uh, we all need to learn how to live with COVID, but and I think as Raymond pointed out, we still need to do things safely, uh, but, but you can see some light at the end of the tunnel. Thanks, Elliot. And why don't you just stay on? Because I want to chat a little bit about what it means to see people in real life, um, as as you were just describing. You know, being able to do meetings that are not virtual in nature for us to be able to round and and go and see. Um, you and I have had the opportunity to uh, visit United General and Peace Island Medical Center um, recently, and we're heading up to Ketchikan in May. Um, would you be uh, willing to share a couple first impressions that you've had of the Northwest Network now that you've been here uh, approximately four months and you've had the ability to to travel and do some in-person rounding at some of our communities? Yeah, I sure would. And it's it's a real privilege to, to be in this role and to be able to spend some time now at least at two of our communities. And I've doing some work with Chris and his team and, and Byron and the facilities. Uh, we've got a lot of work that we're doing and so we've I've made a couple of trips to to UGHC already and I think one of the things that's constant across the two the three organizations that I've been in and I'm sure it'll be the same at Ketchikan is our people our caregivers are amazing and they're so welcoming and so I think that to me is uh, and being able to see people face to face is is so helpful uh, I will say that I've had a couple of people um in the team's environment, one of the funny things is you're just never quite sure how tall somebody is. And so I've had a couple of people mention that, well, you're, you know, you're actually a little taller than I thought you would be. So, you know, that's the that's the beauty of that face to face visit. Um, the visit out to Peace Island was amazing. Talk about what a what an idyllic setting to uh, have a hospital and have our Peace Health Medical Group members there and the work that Jack will be doing to try to keep more of those folks uh, on the island for care and growing services out there, I think is critical to our strategy going forward. And then certainly last but not least, I am really looking forward to uh, making my very first trip up to Alaska. So to see Dory and her team, and I know we have some work to do there from a facilities perspective. So I, I'm looking forward to getting to meet um, in person some of the people that I get to see on teams on a regular basis. Hey, thank you, Elliot. And um, so when when I travel to Ketchikan, I bring two things. I either bring sunshine or I bring more snow. Um, I I usually get uh, clear days in Ketchikan, so hopefully we'll have some beautiful weather up there in May. Um, and then, of course, every time I take the ferry over to Peace Island, it means that it's perfect weather for for flying. And I I always kick myself and say, gosh, why didn't I try to fly? But um, Dana, we're going to do our best to bring a whole lot of sun. Oh, Dory, you've, you're snowing today in Ketchikan. All right, we'll have to bring extra layers. Um, but it's still about 30 days away, so hopefully things will be solidly springtime with lots of sunshine in early May. So thanks very much for that, Elliot. Uh, Heather Cannell, um, you know, as, as Elliot and I talk about travel, I uh, wanted to ask you uh, the latest on what it means for our caregivers who are vaccinated and are traveling. So um, Heather, if you're out there, uh, why don't you go live and talk a little bit about our latest in um, travel policy. Yeah, thanks Chuck. So sorry, apologies, my camera's not operating today. Um, so I just wanna let everybody know, if you don't already know, we've had a couple um, updates to some of our policies in regards to changing CDC guidelines and in alignment with our local health jurisdictions. So I did put in the chat box here um, a link to a wonderful caregiver article if you haven't checked it out um, regarding our personal travel policy. Um, so right now our, our travel policy um, for personal travel requires caregivers who are not fully vaccinated do continue to need con continue to contact employee health after returning from any international or domestic travel. So if you are fully vaccinated, um, you do not need to reach out to us. But um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to call Employee Health. We're happy to talk to you about um, the, the situation and any concerns you may or may not have. Um, in addition, with some of the changing guidelines, we've also updated um, 
our need to stop quarantine caregivers for exposures in, at work, in the community, or at home. So there are some updates to policies. So I would recommend that if you haven't looked at them recently, um, just take a look at them to see if you have any questions or concerns. But do you have changes? Heather, thanks so much for that. And um, just a couple things. Number one, thank you for sending the link um, in chat. And um, of course, the no coronavirus uh, uh, microsite on the caregiver or on our internet is full of various policies and resources in addition to the travel policy. I think the other thing too is that um, we've actually had a fair amount of experience now providing vaccines not only to our broader community but to also thousands and thousands of caregivers um, in the Northwest Network and across Peace Health. And it's my understanding, and I'd love Dr. Carlo Pudi to jump in, um, or if anyone else who's close to the vaccination efforts um, want to join in as well. But really, we've had very, very little um, negative um, reactions as a result of the vaccines. People are um, tolerating them very well, and they are providing um, good protection. But uh, Dr. K, thank you for turning on your camera. I'd love to hear your perspective because I know a lot of people at the beginning said, well, I want to wait, I want to see. Um, and, and I just want to let everyone know the door is still open for uh, caregivers to, to receive vaccines if they haven't yet been vaccinated. Yes, Chuck. Uh, gosh, how I think we have given millions and millions of doses of this vaccine right now, both the mRNA vaccines and Johnson & Johnson is catching up. Um, the current rate of true anaphylaxis after a Moderna vaccine is about 2.6 or 2.9 per million doses. Um, that's about similar that we get with the flu vaccine and Pfizer is about 4.3 or something per million doses. So true anaphylaxis after those doses is really, really um, small. Um, we know that these vaccines, you are going to feel the local side effects and maybe a fever or chills for the first 12 hours. And then after the second dose, the first 24 hours, you'll feel a little uh, under the weather, but mo but it's not permanent. Uh, everybody gets back, uh, feels not going back to their normal self within the tw first 12 to 24 hours. Th these vaccines, in real world have proven to be extraordinarily safe. Furthermore, uh, the initial trial shows us that these vaccines are effective more than six months after Moderna and Pfizer have you know, completed their trials. Those patients still have protective antibody levels, so they are really good in protecting us also. Um, new data that is emerging, I don't know if everybody is aware, but I think both Moderna and Pfizer are doing uh, trials in children. Pfizer, I think, if I'm not wrong, is very close or already has been approved to be given in people above the age of 16. So uh, 12 to 16, I think, uh, Pfizer. Um, the other inter uh, good data that's come out is um, these vaccines were not initially studied in pregnant patients, but there were a lot of pregnant women who actually got the vaccine and they have been tracked very closely by the federal government and the vaccine manufacturers and um, not the vaccine manufacturers actually by the um, by the federal government by the v, um, by the v safe um, pro process and they have not seen any any side effects thus far what we do know is that uh, pregnant moms who get vaccinated actually uh, their babies also have antibodies in them so there is some uh, placental transmission of antibodies so there seems to be some protection that can happen for babies if moms get vaccinated um, lastly and very importantly vaccines come with some very rare side effects um, um, most of us are aware about guillain barre syndrome with the influenza vaccine. There are about 29 very rare immunological phenomena that can happen with vaccines and all those are being tracked and so far none of them are actually being associated with this vaccine. So from a safety standpoint, this is an extraordinarily safe vaccine. Both of them, please, if you have not taken it, get it now. Thank you, Dr. K. I think there's probably two key messages. Um, not only your impassioned plea, if you haven't received the vaccine, please go get it now, because we've had great, great history um, with it. 
but also um, for those of you that have been vaccinated, you are the most influential people in your families and in your communities. So if you have someone who's out there in our community who has questions and you're able to answer uh, for that answer and give them more information, thank you in advance for doing that. One of the reasons Peace Health is continuing to um, vaccinate um, our own patients and opening it wide open to anyone in our communities is we realize that we have to get herd immunity in each and every community that we serve. So across Peace Health, there are mass vaccination sites. There are other venues like pharmacies um, and other providers, but we are continuing to stay in the game because we want to achieve that um, herd immunity in our local communities because it improves the total health. Um, Jan Anderson, I want to thank you for that really, really sweet comment. That just warms my heart. So many people have been working tirelessly um, to not only think about PPE, thinking about vaccinations, um, and really delivering the best possible protection for our patients and caregivers. So that is a great message, and I'm, I'm so thankful for you sharing that. One other aspect of patient, prevent, of patient protection is preventing hospital acquired infections. Um, and so I've asked Jen Moyes to talk to us um, briefly this morning about a new initiative to improve our hand hygiene uh, practices. Jen, thanks for joining and uh, telling us about BioVigil. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. So BioVigil is a small batch that we'll be rolling out at the end of May um, and into June here at St. Joe's. But let me tell you a little bit about it. This product aligns with our Peace Health um, clinical excellence commitment to 100% perfect care, zero harm, and keeping our patients and caregivers safe. Um, as, as Chuck said, this is one way that we can really prevent HAIs here in the hospital through effective hand hygiene to include hand washing and alcohol-based gel. As I shared, this is a small badge that will remind our caregivers to perform hand hygiene. It will vibrate um, when we enter the rooms to remind us that we need to perform hand hygiene. Um, and I think the best way um, I really loved when Dr. Carla Pudi shared with us, he says, I have a coach on my shoulder. It's there for a gentle reminder to continue to help us do the things that we need to do as we have many things to do inside of our busy days. This will be implemented inside of our inpatient nursing units. Um, a, a few of our outpatient procedural areas such as short stay and it will vary inside of our smaller, uh, inside of the critical access hospitals as well. As I shared, this will come to St. Joe's in May and then it will go to our critical access hospitals at the end of uh, summer. Uh, dates to be determined yet. So if you have any more questions, please reach out to your managers or feel free to reach out to me around BioVigil. But I'm really excited to be um, rolling this product out and look forward to uh, questions as we move forward. Thanks, Jen. Really appreciate it. Having those little prompts, those little reminders and using technology to remind us about best practices when it comes to hand washing. Um, the more tools, the better. So thank you for um, uh, giving us that update and uh, we look forward to the lessons learned. So uh, one of the things I just want to, to highlight today is that the frequency about our, uh, the frequency of our caregiver town halls is increasing because we truly, truly want to communicate with you and give you as much life uh, information as possible and give the opportunity for you to ask all of our leaders uh, questions and get those answered promptly. An another thing that we've been doing is we've been paying attention to the results from the caregiver engagement survey and then some subsequent sensing sessions that have occurred. And so I'd love to have um, some of our chief administrative officers and for Elliot to share some of the things that we've learned from each of our communities. Unfortunately, Dory had to, to drop off um, from Ketchikan. So I'm not sure if there's anyone else uh, who's familiar with the process in Ketchikan that might wanna share, but um, Chris, Jack and Elliot, how about if you start and tell us a little bit about our caregiver engagement work. Yeah, thanks, Tech. I, I can go I can go first. Um, it's really been enlightening to hear um, the the messages that and themes that have been coming out in the caregiver engagement survey. 
One of the major themes that we've heard is about safety and specifically about caregiver safety. Um, so we've done a couple of things down here at United, one that's visible, one that's a little bit less visible to really think about keeping our, our, our caregivers safe, you know, in the moment. Um, the first one that we've done is that we've heard, interestingly enough, about drill planning. Are we ready for an active shooter? What if there's a flood? What if we have a generator go out? Um, so with the help of Lindsay Patton, our uh, emergency services coordinator for the Northwest, we've got a drill planning team now that is meeting, uh, I think we're meeting every week right now, um, and looking at different scenarios. And then more importantly, how do we cascade that information to our front line? So they're aware of the work that we're doing as far as the drill planning. The other item that's very visible for us is that we are actually in the process, I mentioned vendors in the hallways earlier, um, and in installing cameras. We have 36 locations, 85 cameras that are helping to keep our building more secure and subsequently our, our caregivers. So those are going in inside the building. They're going in the exterior. We've got the ED very visible now um, from a, a camera perspective. Um, so this is this is really critical for us. You know, we're we're growing, um, and unfortunately, with growth comes some folks that maybe don't have the best of intentions. Um, and we've had that activity. So this is going to go a long way to keeping our folks safe um, in the moment. Thank you, Chris. Chris, thanks very much. I uh, really appreciate that. I'm imagining the CSI type. You know. Um, video screen where they magnify and zoom and, and hopefully you've got the best possible cameras um, so that we can protect our caregivers and protect our patients. Uh, Jack, what's um what's new at Peace Island? What's what are y'all working on out there? Thanks, Chuck. Uh, and, and you know I just like to extend Chris's sentiment. It, it's very humbling to be able to read through the caregivers comments and uh, through those sensing sessions and I uh, for one appreciate people being vulnerable enough and honest enough to share those sentiments with us so that we can act on them. But of course we have responsibility to to act on them and, and some of the things that we're doing are uh, in the interest of safety and staff safety in particular. Uh, we are looking at uh, improving the lighting on one side of our building that has a pathway that's heavily used from the parking lot to the emergency room and it gets very very dark and it, it can be very dangerous especially in the winter so we are doing a lighting assessment so that we can light up that pathway and that side of the building uh, more because there's very little right now we too are actually looking at putting some cameras in various places and particularly in the ERs because we have our um, PARs and registration desks are on the other side of a door from the emergency room and they're out there by themselves or with very few um, support people. So we need to keep an eye on them, make sure they feel that they're safe uh, and that there's somebody always uh, having an eye on them. So that's something we're undergoing an assessment of as well. You know, one of the other key things we're um, always uh, seem to be working on is our staffing and in staffing out here at Peace Island is a challenge to say the least. But we've implemented some, uh, we're, we've asked HR to partner with us and see if the strategies we're using are still working. And if not, you know, we're trying to think out of the box and get creative, <clears throat> pardon me. One of those creative uh, uh, things that we've done is I've been able to recruit uh, a couple of the imaging nurses at St. Joseph to come over and participate in our endoscopy OR procedures because they're, they're experts in moderate sedation and, and managing those patients. So that's been really successful. We had, we've had somebody come out here a couple days and we're, we're in the process of recruiting more in, in addition to HR's efforts. Um, and then uh, the, the last thing we heard is the necessity to uh, have more back and forth communication between the leadership team and the caregivers, obviously. So between myself and the exec team here, we are participating in um, both the clinic side of operations, uh, DMS meetings on a regular basis, as well as the hospital side of operations, DMS, because they function in different ways yet together at different times. So we're trying to provide more access to them, to us, uh, in order to hear. And I've learned tons of things already over the last few weeks. So that's been really, really, uh, 
beneficial to both sides, I hope. So. Thanks, Jack. That's a mm -hmm. that's a lot going on at Peace Island. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, so Elliot, uh, I know that um, you're next to give an update, and I think that um, Blair Clement has asked a question that I think is something that you've um, responded to previously with respect to safety and security. So, um, but I'd uh, love to hear an update from you about our caregiver engagement survey, and perhaps if you could answer Blair's question and comment, uh, it'd be a two for one. Okay, well, let's let's do that first, because I see that she did put that in. And so uh, one of the things from a safety perspective here at St. Joseph's Medical Center is uh, in responding to what we heard in this read in the survey as well as heard from the sensing session is the ability for folks to have uh, a way to quickly call those code grades code grays. And so one of the things that we just implemented here at St. Joe's uh, are new uh, real-time locating system, RTLS badges, and on that badge that the caregivers wear, um, there's a button, and if they push that, that's what automatically calls the code gray to the location exactly where that caregiver happens to be. And so with the rollout, um, there's just been some accidental pushes of those buttons, and sometimes they get hit by something else that's up, up around the person's neck. And so uh, I have noticed over the last several days that the volume is going down, but it is a good test that the system works. Uh, so that's one of the areas we're currently uh, Folks closest to the patients uh, from a nursing perspective are wearing those badges and the team is evaluating use of that technology for other caregivers that are involved in direct patient care. So Blair, that's why uh, the code grays are happening and, and it is decreasing in frequency. Uh, the other area, not only in terms of I think safety, but also in terms of sense of engagement has to do with the time that our leaders have to round. And so one of the things that we have done uh, across the network is we have standard work now from the 9 to 10 a.m. hour, uh, at least here in the in the lower Northwest network where leaders are able to have no meetings and we're able to be able to be out and about rounding with folks. And so, for instance, this morning I mentioned that um, I use that rounding time to go with some of my colleagues to look at some space. And so it's just a nice time we can connect with, with folks. Um, I got to meet some new people that I haven't had the chance uh, to meet. And so I think that's a way for us to communicate uh, directly one to one with caregivers. It's also a way for us to share information back on some of the safety stops that we have. And it's a way for us to convey that information again directly to to a group of caregivers. So I believe that will be uh, that's why I said earlier, I think it's going to help us both from a sense of safety, but also um, from that sense of connectedness so that the team can feel that you know we're hearing and re reporting back on the work that we're doing. Thanks a lot, Elliot. And I know we have about two minutes left in the meeting. And one of the great things about a Teams chat is I get all kinds of live time information. So Brian Kluart, our Northwest Network Director for Facilities and Project Management, uh, let me know that we're going to be spending over a quarter million dollars of uh, uh, in investment in cameras, panic buttons, and additional badge readers for door control across the network. So we are absolutely making real and tangible investments in caregiver and provider safety. Um, as, as we think about closing the, the meeting out, I, I do want to just leave you with one theme. Uh, we are definitely uh, looking towards the future. We are looking towards what it means to uh, provide care to our communities, living with COVID rather than just reacting to COVID. And so I think the next thing that I'm going to be very excited about is this thing that Elliot just touched base on in terms of when we learn something from a safety stop or when we learn something from a serious safety event and then we have a root cause analysis that involves providers and caregivers uh, really evaluating what happened and how we could prevent it from happening again, that we're gonna share those lessons across the network. And not only among the leaders, but also unit managers and frontline caregivers across all shifts. So that's the big challenge that we're going to embark upon over the next three months to improve um, our patient safety and protecting our patients. 
Uh, Rick, thank you so much for putting into chat um, some of the caregiver engagement responses up in Ketchikan. Uh, we didn't have time to get in that, but um, having that written report is extremely valuable. So in closing, I want to thank everyone who attended today. I want to thank everyone who asked questions and engaged in chat. I have one final request for you before you uh, leave our meeting today. Please give us some real live time feedback in chat. Put a couple comments in. We work each and every time to improve these caregiver town halls, and so your feedback is incredibly valuable to us. So with the spirit of spring and, and uh, renewal, um, we want everyone to uh, uh, look forward to the brighter months of the spring and summer. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for attending today and be well as you go out and care for our patients and care for our communities. And thank you in advance for putting comments in chat. Thank you and goodbye.